to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim the news unto the poor. The gospel the of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of and Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. To the young evangelist Timothy, Paul said, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse number 15. Welcome to our study of 1 Timothy. Timothy is a young evangelist who has been placed in the town of Ephesus to preach the gospel and to build up the Lord's church. And Paul is writing to encourage Timothy along the lines of faithfulness to God and continuing in the doctrine of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. As always, we're so glad that you've joined us for our broadcast today. The Gospel of Christ program is being brought to you by members of the Church of Christ worldwide. And as always, we encourage you to visit our website, thegospelofchrist.com. Free videos, audios, CDs, DVDs, transcripts can be found there, as well as a host of other Bible material. And if you've got a Bible question, or you'd like to study further about God and His message, we'd love for you to send us an email or contact us, and that information is available as well on our website. 1 Timothy is all about church conduct. That Timothy is unique. Unlike some books, Timothy, Paul comes right out in 1 Timothy and tells us exactly why he is writing. Key verse and the thematic statement is found in 1 Timothy 3, verses 14 and 15. I want you to notice this with me. The scripture says, These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly, but if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how, to con how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. And so what's Timothy all about? Paul says, I'm writing these things to you. There's the purpose statement. Though I want to come to you shortly, but if I'm delayed, if I don't get to come there, I write. Here's the purpose. So that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is church of the living God, pillar and ground of truth. What's 1 Timothy all about? It's about church conduct. Now, when we think of church conduct, we're not just talking about in worship. Sure, the church meets together, assembles together, and remembers the Lord's death every first day of the week, Acts 20, verse 7, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 20 and 21. But we're more than just the church when we assemble together. Our conduct as members of the church of Christ ought to be exemplar everywhere we go. For example, in the assembly, no doubt we are the Lord's body and the Lord's people, but out of the assembly, we're also Christians and our conduct reflects on the Lord's church. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 27 following, Paul said, and you are members of the body of Christ, you are the body of Christ and members individually one of another. And so Paul will talk about in the book of 1 Timothy some things related to daily Christian living. Also, we are part of the church in the work that we do. The work of the church is an important part of church life. And thus, Paul will discuss evangelism. He'll discuss the helping of widows and orphans. And then, church conduct is unique in that it relates to the organization of the church also, how should the church conduct itself in organization? Well, Paul will discuss in 1 Timothy 3 that the church is to be organized. Christ is the head. Then you've got elders who are overseers who meet those qualifications and deacons who serve the congregation working under the elders as official servants. And so in every way of our life, as worship goes, as I live my Christian life, as we work in the church, as the church is organized, Paul writes 
to encourage proper church conduct. Now, again, that does relate to worship. I can remember, and maybe you can as well, maybe a time when you were a, a youngster, a young person, and you had to learn how to behave in worship. Maybe like me, you got thumped on the back of the head a time or two. Maybe somebody had to take you out and teach you the right way to worship. It does relate to that. But that's not all church conduct is. Every facet and part of my life, I represent the Lord's church. And if you're a child of God, you do as well. And thus, our conduct must be of the highest level. Now, let's talk for just a moment by way of review and give some key ideas, maybe per chapter and key thoughts throughout the book that will introduce 1 Timothy to us in a very vivid way. We've already mentioned it. One of the great statements in 1 Timothy that is so practical and relevant to all of us is 1 Timothy 1, verse number 15. Notice what Paul says. Paul says... This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Now, why did Paul feel like chief or top of all sinners? Here's why. Paul had done some things he was no doubt very regretful for. He was there when Stephen was stoned holding the coats. In Acts chapter 8, Paul is wreaking havoc on the church. He's dragging men and women into prison. Acts chapter 9, he has official documents giving him authority to keep persecuting the church. And so he'd done horrible things. He'd done things he was regretful of and shameful for. And yet because of that, Paul said, I am chief of sinners. But really, can't we all relate to Saul or Paul? I've sinned, you've sinned, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3 verse 23, there is none righteous, no, not one. And it's because of those sins that we've committed that Jesus went to the cross. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him. By His stripes we are healed. He had to suffer and die because of my sin and your sin. And so on a personal, practical level, we're all reminded of our sinful actions and our need for Jesus Christ in our life. But then the good news, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, another very vivid passage. God wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Yes, we all feel the, the sting of sin. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 55 following, but God wants men not to stay in that state, not to be lost forever, but to go to heaven. You know, when I think about God's desire, here you see the great love of God. God so loved the world, He gave. Gave what? His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God wants all men to be saved, so much so that Jesus tasted death for every man. Hebrews 2, verses 9 and 10. Jesus is the propitiation for our sins, not for ours alone, for the sins of the whole world. 1 John 2, verses 1 and 2. You know, when I think about Jesus and God's desire for all men to be saved. I can't help but think about the beautiful words of Matthew 11, verse 28. Here's the invitation of Jesus. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. What does Jesus want? Jesus wants all men to come to Him. To, to know His salvation, to, to see His love, His grace, and His mercy, and to have freedom from sin and Satan. Now, it is the church's job to be that pillar of truth which sends out the message and stands up for what's right. That's one of the great lessons we learn in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14 and 15. Along with that thematic statement, Paul will say, I'm writing these things to you. Yes, I want to come to you shortly. 
But if I'm delayed, now I'm writing to you so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God. Now notice this, the pillar and ground of the truth. The church ought to be a foundation landmark standing up for truth where all men can go to, know about it, and know that God's truth is going to be exhibited and shown clearly from that place. You see, my friends, this not only illustrates the work the church ought to do, but it illustrates the power of truth. John 8, verse 32, Jesus said, You will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. What is that truth? Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. John 17, verse 17. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 10 and 11 combines that idea of the truth with the church of the Lord Jesus Christ when it says that God's eternal purpose for princes and principalities was that the church should make God's message known. How is the church the bulwark or the foundation of truth? in that its purpose is to proclaim God's truth to all nations. Matthew 9, verses 36 through 38. A very tender scene. Jesus looked out upon the multitudes. They were like sheep without a shepherd. He had compassion on them. And then He said to His disciples, Truly, harvest is plentiful, laborers are few. Pray the Lord of the harvest, He'll send out laborers into His harvest or His field. I'm that laborer. You're that laborer. The church has the responsibility to preach the Word. Be instant in season and out of season. 2 Timothy 4 verse 2. The church has the responsibility to speak as the oracles of God. 1 Peter 4 verse 11. What God says, we ought to say in love. Preach the truth in love. Ephesians 4 15. But remember, in preaching the truth in love, you never become somebody's enemy. Galatians 4 verse 16, Paul asked a rhetorical question. Have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? No. You never become somebody's enemy by teaching or speaking the truth of God's Word and God's will. Now, another lesson that we learn from 1 Timothy is that we all should be first and foremost concerned with saving ourselves and others. I want you to notice 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 16. As we think about the church, me and you, us Christians, as the pillar of truth, I'm concerned first with my own soul, then with the souls of others. 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 16 says, Take heed to yourself, speaking to Timothy, and to the doctrine, continue in them, for in doing this you will save both yourself and all those who hear you. Why is it I've got to stay close to the truth, live my life by the truth, and do what God wants? Friends, it's so important because the truth is what has the power to save. First, I'm concerned about going to heaven myself. My number one priority, and this is not selfish, this is the responsibility I have, is my own soul. Mark 8, verse 36 and 37. Jesus asked, What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world, loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Friend, my soul is the most important thing that I have. My top priority is to make sure first that I take heed to myself that I'm careful, that I beware, that I'm watchful and making sure that I'm living like I ought to. And then we also can focus on saving all those who hear and see our life. Luke 19.10, Jesus came to seek and save the lost. He said to Christians who were first concerned about themselves, go into all the world, preach the gospel unto every creature. Like in Ezekiel 33, my responsibility is to sound out the warning. That's all I can do. Spread the seed. Luke chapter 8. Say what God has said. Tell of His grace and His mercy and love. And then, people who have a good and honest heart will hear that message and want to do exactly what God says. Now, another blockbuster passage from 1 Timothy teaches us along the same lines about the purity of life that we ought to have as Christians. Notice 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse number 22. The Scripture says, 
Do not lay hands on anyone hastily, nor share in other people's sins. Here's Paul's encouragement. Keep yourself pure. Ah, purity of heart. Those are things that all of us need to strive for. Peter said in 1 Peter 2 verse 11, I beg you, as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul. As a child of God, I ought to strive for purity and holiness. Be holy, for he who called you is holy. Leviticus 11, 44, 1 Peter 1, verses 14 and 15. Well, you know, when we talk about purity, let's make that practical. I want to be pure as it relates to sexual relations. The only pure and approved place for that is in the bounds of marriage. Hebrews 13, 4 says this, Marriage, it's honorable. The bed, undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. Only inside the relationship of marriage is the sexual relation approved. Is that right? In the sight of God. That means that before marriage, that means that when one is married and relations occur with a person who isn't his spouse, those are impure. Those are ungodly. But it doesn't just relate to sexually. We're talking about purity in every way, in our language, in our speech. We ought to be pure. We ought not to speak in an ungodly way. Colossians 3 verse 8 and Ephesians 4 verse 29 following teaches us we're to let no filthy communication come out of our mouth. And so our speech. We must be careful about our speech. We must be careful about our dress. Purity in dress. Paul will address this. 1 Timothy chapter 2, beginning in verse number 10 through 12 following, Paul says that we're to dress in a modest way that proclaims or professes godliness. How should we dress? In such a way that when people look at us, they can tell by our dress that we're trying to live in a godly way and in a godly fashion. Then as Christians, another blockbuster passage in the book of 1 Timothy teaches us the need to fight the good fight of faith. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse number 12. The scripture says, Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you are also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. As a Christian, I've got to fight the good fight of faith. What's that mean? Well, not only does it mean I stand up for truth, but every day I live, I'm fighting against Satan. I'm fighting against the wiles of the devil. First, or excuse me, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 17. We've got to take up the whole armor of God that we may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. I am in a battle and a fight for my eternal soul every day. Satan is the enemy, 1 Peter 5, verse 8. He has workers or ministers who are trying to work against us today and the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. They tempt all of us, 1 John 2, verses 15 through 17. But I also fight the good fight of faith, as I contend earnestly for the faith, Jude verse 3. As I preach the word, 2 Timothy 4 verse 2, as I live my life by the gospel of Christ every day, living as that shining light, I'm fighting the good fight of faith. Now, for just a moment, I want us to think about some of the practical lessons that we find in 1 Timothy chapters 1 and 2 for just a few moments. Now, as we think about this book and as we think about its main theme, church conduct, Paul begins by tying that, weaving that theme together in chapter 1, showing us that as Christians, church conduct means as members of the body of Christ, we teach no other doctrine than what God has proclaimed. Notice 1 Timothy chapter 1, beginning in verse number 3. The scripture says, As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine, nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies which cause disputes rather than godly edification which is in the faith. What is Paul trying to get across in chapter 1? Teach 
No other doctrine. Why? Because only the doctrine of Christ will help us to have a relationship with God, will help us to be close to God. 2 John 9, John said, Whoever transgresses and does not teach the doctrine of Christ does not have God as his Father. Why do I teach the doctrine of Christ? Only the doctrine of Christ makes one a child of God. Only the doctrine of Christ will help one to be in a blessed state. I know that because it's the antithesis of what we find or is diametrically the opposite of what we find in Galatians 1 verses 6 through 9. Paul says, I marvel that you're turning away so soon from him who called you into the grace of Christ to another gospel, which is not another gospel, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. Paul says, even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than that what we have preached, let him be accursed. As I've said before, so now I say again, if anyone teaches any other gospel, let him be accursed. The opposite of that is, if we teach the gospel, we are in that blessed state. We do have that, that closeness, that relationship with God. And so, why is it? We must teach no other doctrine. It's the only one. Friend, there's only one doctrine. Jude 3 tells us this, Contend earnestly for the faith, now notice this, which was once for all delivered to the saints. The doctrine, the gospel, the teaching of Christ, we've got to teach it because that's all there is. There's not going to be any more. It's precious, it's special, and it's saving power is beyond limit to the person who will accept it. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation. Now, I also want you to notice this from chapter 1. Our motivation in teaching that one gospel, it must be sincere. Paul says, now the purpose, 1 Timothy 1 verse 5, the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from an unfeigned or sincere faith. Why is it that we insist and that we boldly proclaim that one gospel? What's the motivation in doing that? It's not to be mean or unkind or to offend, no. The Bible says the purpose of the commandment, love from a pure heart. What's that mean? We preach the truth in love. Ephesians 4.15, love for lost souls has to be the motivation for everything we do. Why do we preach the one church? Why do we preach baptism for the mission of sins? Why do we preach Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life? You can't get to heaven without Him because we love people enough that we want them to hear the message and go to heaven. Love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from a sincere faith. Our conscience is the echo of knowledge we provide for ourselves. As I study, as I read, as I come in line with the Word of God, I must preach that message and my faith is the reason that I preach those things. Then we turn to chapter 2. Of 1 Timothy, and we learn another very powerful lesson, and that is the responsibility the Christian has in prayer. Prayer indeed will have powerful results. For James says, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man overcomes much. What about the Christian in prayer? Notice 1 Timothy chapter 2, beginning in verse number 1. The Scripture says, Therefore I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, and intercessions be, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. What do I know about prayer? God wants me and He wants you to pray for all men. Now you tie that in with verse 4, that God wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. What then do you think our prayer ought to be? Well, we ought to pray for peace. There's no doubt about that. No doubt about that. We ought to pray for goodwill. We ought to pray for health and God's blessings. But, but when I pray for people, especially kings and those who are in authority, I'm praying that just as God wants those men to be saved, that doors will be opened where God can work in me and work in you and work in other Christians so that that indeed can be accomplished. Now another lesson that we learn in 1 Timothy has to do with women and their role and activity in worship. 
Women are not to be leaders in worship. Women are not to be in authority. That's not the way God designed it. They're not to be preachers. God never intended that. And friend, this is not anything against women. It's just simply the hierarchy and the plan God set up. Now, notice from your own Bible, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. The Scripture says, Let a woman learn in silence with all submission, and I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. When men and women gather together, you've got God desires men to pray everywhere. 1 Timothy, Timothy 2.8 You've got women who are not to rise up and be in a position of authority, so we've got a mixed assembly here. And when that occurs, God says, let a woman learn in silence with all submission. And Paul says, I do not permit a woman to pray, teach, or to, or to teach, or to be in authority over a man. Now someone says, well, Paul didn't like women, and Paul was a sexist, and that's just his opinion. Now wait a minute. Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 37. If anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things I write to you, these are the commandments of God. Paul said, these aren't my ideas and my teaching. It's not that I'm sexist and I don't like women. The things I write, they're the commands of God because as we know, Paul was inspired by the Holy Spirit. 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 and 17. And so what do we learn from this first lesson in the book of 1 Timothy? God wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. All men can feel as though Paul did that we're chief of sinners because our own sin, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But again, the good news is God wants men to be saved. Friend, we ask you out of love and sincerity, have you obeyed the gospel? Have you become a Christian? Do you really believe Jesus is the Son of God? John 8 verse 24. Would you be willing to repent and turn from sin. Acts 3 verse 19. Would you make that great confession? Romans 10 verse 10 that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And would you do what Peter said? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. If you've never obeyed the gospel, friend, we encourage you to become a child of God. Again, we thank you for joining our lesson today. And if able, please stop by our website, The Gospel of Christ, as we strive to proclaim the good news of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about all souls, not your walk. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. God be the glory. This is the gospel of Christ.